we now move on to an important motion about the health-related effects of electromagnetic fields, and I call upon Tonio, Tonia Antoniazzi to move the motion. Thank you very much, Chair, and I'm honoured to serve under your chairmanship, Mr Holborn. This Westminster Hall debate is indeed a very timely one. It comes off the back of a historic decision by Glastonbury Council to oppose the rollout of 5G due to a severe lack of evidence about its effect on the health of those living and working around 5G sites. In the words of Martin Paul, Emeritus Professor of Biochemistry at Washington State University, putting in tens of millions of 5G antenna without a single biological test for safety has got to be about the stupidest idea anyone has had in the history of the world. We have seen the rollout of 5G postponed in Brussels when Céline Fremont, Environment and Energy Minister, identified that it was not compatible with Belgian radiation safety standards. And a planned upgrade to 5G in Geneva was stopped through the application of the precautionary principle until independent findings on possible health damage become available. Now, I was approached by an old friend who is now a constituent about how a sensitivity to electromagnetic fields seriously affects her health and the way she lives her life. Annely lives in France for part of the year and has to return to Wales as her health deteriorates working as a university lecturer. I was intrigued by the effects and wanted to know more, so I have been in contact with a number of people who either have concerns about the health-related effects or are suffering first-hand. Following discussions with others, I was keen to secure a debate on the subject because the health concerns are being swept under the carpet by the government and there appears to be an absolute refusal to acknowledge that these health-related effects even exist. To initiate a conversation about electromagnetic sensitivity has had members of my own team and family telling me that it is all made up. That in itself motivated me to keep reading and to speak to as many people who I can in Wales and beyond who are suffering. And what shocked me was the number of people who have ES who are too afraid to talk pub publicly about their illness as, as they are really wary of being humiliated and ostracised. Electrosensitivity is a symptomatic sensitivity to electric or magnetic fields of any frequency, including radio frequency transmissions. It's a condition first described in 1932. It's when a person's physiology is affected by external electromagnetic fields, giving rise to a spectrum of symptoms, often neurological. It is therefore an illness caused by environmental agents, essentially an environmental toxic pollutant. It's a condition that can arise due to continued exposure to an environment polluted by man-made EM and RF wireless signals at levels at orders of magnitude below heating effects and is well understood in many other countries. Symptoms include headaches, fatigue, disturbed sleep, tingling, pains in limbs, head or face, stabbing pains, brain fog and impaired cognitive function, dizziness, tinnitus, nosebleeds, palpitations and others. But as we have seen already with chronic fatigue syndrome, there was a disbelief about those presenting with symptoms and indeed construed by others as a psychological illness through a lack of knowledge and difficulty to diagnose. I believe that electrosensitivity will be recognised in years to come, hopefully sooner, and that the government will have to own up to their part in that. And I will be honest with you and say that this is not a subject I ever thought I would be standing here talking about. Mm -hmm. Yet, as a mother, I was always keen to charge my son's phone outside of his bedroom while never applying the same rule to myself. Parents seem to care more for their children, especially when we hear that masks being put up on on primary schools, more recently one in Harangay, they are stopped and the masks are no longer being put up there. There is something in this. I do worry also about the, source, the impact of social media on mental health and the increasing addictive nature of smartphones, which is impacting on the lives of the youngest of children. There is some evidence for effects of radio frequency signals on mental health and behaviour in children and young people. 
yet they are not currently considered when trying to address the current increase in mental health and behavioural problems in the UK. Minister, can we include the effects of wireless signals when considering solutions for mental health and behavioural problems in children and young people? The recent advice from the UK Chief Medical Officers on screen time and well-being in young people has ignored evidence for the adverse effects of wireless signals. I, I will on that point. Can I just ask you a question about the wider environmental impact? Because she'll know that 4G is the carbon footprint of all of aviation. 5G is going to be a lot more. And what's more, we're now hearing that 5G will have a detrimental impact on insect life, which globally is decreasing at 2.5% a year. And given the insects are required to pollinate all fruits and vegetables and therefore essential to humanity, it doesn't she think that we should apply the precautionary principle here till we know precisely what the impact will be both on insects and on carbon footprint before hurtling ahead for commercial reasons? I thank my honourable friend for his contribution and I think that climate change and uh, the, the insect life is something that we need to take into consideration as well when we are discussing the impact of electrosensitivity, uh, electromagnetic fields. As MPs, we have a duty of care to our constituents. There's no escaping the fact that when questions are posed about the safety of new technologies by MPs, schools, local authorities and others, they are given a standard reply from governments. People who question about the health-related effects of elect electromagnetic fields are just coming up against a brick wall, and I want to break through that wall and pose a number of questions to the Minister today. I like to think that taking safety into account when developing products and considering safety and sustainability it really is the smart way to move forward into the future. Yes, I will. I remember the uh, Trade and Industry Select Committee many years ago. We investigated this but, and we had all sorts of experts, but nobody could come to a conclusion about it. That's not to say my honourable friend is wrong. That's just to say it was looked at about 20 years ago. But the question I was going to ask her, is there any evidence that that can affect the behaviour of animals, for example? Not only human beings, but animals. Is there any evidence of that? I, I thank my honourable friend for his, his contribution because there is evidence uh, which has been seen in animals. I can't quote it to him now, but I have read about it. And also, it's, the animals don't have the screen time. So when we're talking about the impact of magnetic fields, you know, and we're relating it to maybe smartphones and 5G, in the, you know, from now on into the future. Um, the animals aren't sitting there, and there is evidence there. I would have to find it and send it on to him. I shall, yes. On this point, there is clear evidence that in particular with high-frequency 5G, and there's some denial that there may be such high-frequency, that there is enormous loss of insect life, and to get the coverage, we need so these... these these, uh, whatever, these little pylons or whatever they're called, every 150 metres, there'll be enormous coverage. And if there's substantial damage, uh, there's incredible risk. And surely we should apply the precautionary principle, uh, even if there's all sorts of commercial threats occurring to the government behind, behind closed doors if they don't roll their head. Uh, thank you, Chair. Th thank you. I thank my honourable friend. I think we need to look at precautionary principle when we apply uh, anything. And 5G has come upon us so quickly and it's been embraced um, by many councils uh, and, and the government as, as a solution to connectivity. But I will be totally honest with you. I would rather see fibre broadband in all of fixed wired broadband in all of the houses in my constituency and across Wales rather than have the masts being put up everywhere and the impact that that will have just because it seems to be a cheaper solution. Now, I will not accept a response today that electrosensitivity does not exist. There are studies which show that it does. There are many effects that are not all subjective, such as effects on proteins, DNA, cell death, altered brain activity, effects in animals, which my honourable friends have spoken about. And these can be measured and cannot be dismissed as all in the mind. We all know that technology and decisions relating to it can have unintended consequences. 
and this one such consequence is being discussed today, the impact on our health. Similarly, for the effect on mental health in humans, it could be argued that it may be the online contact or screen time having these effects, but when combined with studies in animals, as we have spoken about, we can see that the signals themselves can have effects. Animals, as I have said, do not look at screens or use social media. In the past, no matter what questions, evidence of concerns that have been put to Public Health England or the Department of Health and Social Care, they have responded with their standard reply. This included them saying that they have thoroughly assessed the evidence in the AGNIR 212, of 2012 report. The World Health Organization, International Agency for Research on Cancer, classified all radio frequency signals as possible human carcinogen in 2011. Based on significant increased risks of glenomas and acoustic neuromas associated with mobile or cordless phone use in humans, as well as animal and mechanistic studies. Subsequent studies have strengthened the evidence in humans and have provided clear evidence of tumours in animals. Some scientists are even calling for the classification to be upgraded to a definite carcinogen. Why then, Minister, has Public Health England removed all men mention of the IR IARC classification for radio frequency signals from their current website? They inform people about other possible carcinogens. People cannot make informed decisions or protect those they are responsible for if the information is withheld. Will the Minister commit to inform people that all radio frequency signals are a possible human carcinogen on their website, in their leaflets, in communications and presentations? Following the publication of the paper in Reviews on Environmental Health on the AGNIR 2012 report, AGNIR was quietly disbanded. However, the inaccurate report is still on their website and being used to justify their, uh, their advice to MPs and the public. When will the 2012 report be retracted due to it being scientifically inaccurate and out of date? The Department of Education in England and Northern Ireland have said that it is the responsibility of schools to carry out risk assessments before technologies are introduced and used. But schools cannot safeguard pupils or staff through a risk assessment if they have been given inaccurate information. Can schools be accurately informed about these risks so that they can fulfil their child safeguarding responsibilities? Schools and parents could have been informed that wireless signals are a possible human carcinogen, that there is evidence of damage to fertility, and there are effects on the brain that may adversely affect brain development. Schools could have been advised to use wired technologies to prevent possible harm to health and the development of children. The EU sent out a cautionary message about Wi-Fi regarding school children, yet only France removed it from their primary schools. The Cyprus government has produced short and practical videos warning teenagers and pregnant women about the risks of radio frequency signals and offering simple actions. When will children, young people and parents or pregnant women in the UK be offered similar advice so that they can take steps to stay safer? Public Health England and the Department of Health and Social Care, by denying the existence of adverse effects and providing inaccurate information, have prevented the UK public from living and working in safe environments. When will the government listen to the warnings from scientists and doctors to help MPs better protect their constituents? Because we need to be honest about the risks if we are going to have the possibility of developing safer technologies in the future. Don't ignore the fact that people do have ES. These people do exist and their lives are being ruined. Others do, do not have ES also have genuine concerns about the rollout of 5G. You don't have to suffer to be concerned because the name 5G is deceptive. It implies a simple upgrade from the current 4G or fourth generation wireless, but 5G, it is so much more than that. It is a massive experiment and the consequences of these actions are largely unknown. One thing I feel very strongly about is for people with ES, there is no escape. Literally, they're going to have nowhere to go. Can we make safe public spaces and live in and work in environments so that everyone has somewhere to exist? This is extremely urgent, particularly with the introduction of 5G, smart cities, smart roads, the Internet of Things, thousands of 5G satellites. 
I'd like to see a government that gives a commitment to creating white zones where people can go and have respite when they need it and a government which will pledge to provide up-to-date, transparent and independent research on the impact of electromagnetic fields and replace the AGNIR report from 2012. There is a need to review the science as no one will agree, disagree how technology moves on at such a quick pace and there is even more need to keep up to date with the science. And finally, from one of the letters I have recently received, a heartfelt request from a mum in West Wales. I'm told you think the only way forward is a white zone. I agree. But also to get ES recognised as a disability. I've spoken with my MP and he agrees that if ES could be recognised as a disability, other things such as access to education would fall into place. And I agree with Sarah's statement. Her struggle is real and saw the lives of many people largely ignored and belittled. And also that of my old classmate, Annalee, whose life in the past 10 years has dramatically been impacted by electromagnetic fields on her health. We can no longer hide and pretend it's not happening and this cannot be swept under the carpet, especially in light of future impact of te technological advancements at the expense of people and our environment. To conclude, it is evident the government needs to ensure that the research is independent. It needs to recognise electrohypersensitivity as an occupational disease, as a French court did earlier this year, and put guidelines in place for employers to make reasonable adjustments so that their employees can continue to work in a healthy environment. I remember the days of planning to meet someone without a mobile phone to say you were running late or couldn't make it. Advancements in technology have literally swept through our lives and before I'm accused of being a Luddite, I think that technology is wonderful and offers great many benefits to all. But we cannot continue to deny that for some there is an impact on their health and well-being. This is also not about stopping progress. This is about making sure that there are no health concerns with that technology and about doing what is best for our constituents. Thank you, Mr Hollibon. Question is that this House has considered health related effects of electromagnetic fields. Dr. David Drew. Thank you, Ms. Oliver. I'm delighted to serve under your uh, chairmanship this afternoon, and uh, my honourable friend Fagara has done a, an admirable job at least raising the issue that the precautionary principle should be paramount before we take on any new technology. Now, from the outset, I'll just say, represent the semi-rural area, please give me 3G. I'm not worried about 4G or 5G. I just want 3G with all the consequences that brings. So I've still got at least one of my market towns that can't get that. So just a little <laughs> plug there. That let's get the existing technology in place. But I think what my honourable friend has said is worthy of debate, worthy of the government taking seriously, and worthy of the public understanding that their representatives there are listening to them. Now, Stroud being Stroud, there's an active 5G campaign already underway saying they don't want it, they'll do anything to stop it, and uh, please, can we listen to those who have already raised concerns? Like my honourable friend, I've, I've met people who are incredibly affected by electromagnetic sensitivity to the extent that they moved into a house with a smart meter, and had to have that smart meter taken out. And even to the extent they asked their next door neighbor to take their smart meter out. And once they removed the two, their health dramatically improved. Now, you know, people say this is all psychosomatic. I've seen the evidence that people do have sensitivity to these electromagnetic uh, waves. And we ignore that at certainly their health and biological consequences, but maybe there will be many more. And I want to talk principally because my honourable friend's done a valuable um, job of explaining the, 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 the possible health and uh, biological impacts. So I want to say a bit more about planning in a minute. But I think it would be only fair to ask the government to at least respond to the growing evidence that there is from the International EMF Scientific Appeal, FIRE, the Physicians' Health Initiative for Radiation and the Environment, and other reputed scientists in this area, and indeed communities. I mean, Brussels has now stopped the rollout 
a number of cities in uh, California have stopped the rollout. So there is growing concern, and one that, of course, needs to be recognised and needs to be answered. And it's just a shame that at the moment we seem to be in complete ignorance of some of the effects of 5G. I've not seen proper medical studies that deal with people's uh, susceptibility to it, and it would be right and proper for us to see those studies. I give way to my honourable friend. Very grateful. Can I say, Chair, I'm going to have to leave before the end, so I apologise for that. But can I ask my honourable friend whether he's aware of the, aware of the veracity of reports that these 5G, 5G companies, which have got enormous commercial power, have already put pressure on the government to move ahead quickly and are actually lifting up threats similar to what we saw with TTIP, that we, that we may have signed up already, and if we sort of pull back on the basis of the precautionary principle and risks to human health and indeed wildlife health, that we, we'll end up in a position where the government is sued by big commercial interests, and we should resist that in the interests of the public. Well, well, I thank him, and of course I agree with that. And the work he's done on air quality is really very important in this place. And at last, politicians in general are beginning to listen to the threats. And it just seems lamentable at the time that we now understand the threats of air quality through pollution from cars, dare I say incineration and other things, we now have another technology coming in which could be as damaging. Maybe we won't see the effects for years, but we will in decades unless we actually understand what this technology can do to some people. It may not be everybody. It may be down to genetic susceptibility, but we ought to listen to what is happening uh, to those, those people. So, as I said, it would be useful if the government were to put on record some of the studies and their responses to that studies. And as my honourable friend has just said, one of the real problems is, now we're into 5G, there's a view that where there are already masts, you can just add to. Where there are no masts, you can already put additional technology on them. And I, you know, I asked the minister, the biggest worry is that there's a view, certainly in Stroud, that lampposts will be a perfectly acceptable means by which these masks can be substituted by not having to put new ones up. You can just put them on to existing infrastructure. So it would be useful to know from the Minister what powers there are. Because I understand in terms of the electronic communications code powers, it's virtually granted unlimited power to the companies to either construct or maintain or develop the current infrastructure without any planning permission. It's all done under delegated responsibility, which means that the general public don't even know what's going up, because normally these things would not be publicised. And, of course, there is really very little recourse unless they take court action to try and stop it. Well, the means by which they can do that, even to the extent it may be on private land, so the landowner has very little authority to stop this from happening. This is something that needs to be looked into and properly investigated. So I would ask the government, because I'm not going to speak for very long, to look at the way in which it can consult the public. The public are getting worried. Now, maybe the scare stories haven't got the full scientific rigour that they should have because they know nothing more than what they have been told by various experts in the field. And, of course, there's always experts on either side of the argument, but we are putting the, 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 the case here that at the very least there should be an open and honest and transparent investigation of what the health and biological impacts are of this new technology. And, of course, the financial interests are about driving forward 5G. This isn't being done for altruistic reasons. It's being done because they stand to make an awful lot of money out of it in a very short period of time. So we need to look at that. And again, you know, it does exacerbate the, 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 you know, the, the digital divide. As I say, give me 3G at the moment. I mean, that's what I would be satisfied with across the whole of my constituency. So I would hope, having listened to what my honourable friend says, the Minister will, will be able to say some things about what plans they have to investigate the impact on the ecosystem, because that, again, is as important as human beings. We need to keep our, our bugs and our birds and our, uh, and our other uh, fauna... Uh, in the state they are in, given that they're under enormous attack 
uh, and that's something we talked about yesterday in terms of the climate change strategy instrument that we passed. It isn't just our survival, it's the survival, survival of other species. And it would be a tragedy if we've done stuff in other ways to protect them, and yet we let 5G come in, because there are allegations it has an impact on, on other parts of the, uh, of the, the, the rural, um, well, the, 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 uh, the, the different species, particularly in rural areas, because that's where we see many of our, uh, uh, you know, our living creatures. And the final point I would make is that part of the problem now is, as already said, this is coming through without really much recourse to any questioning of the technology. But the biggest problem is the speed at which it's now being introduced. There is really no way in which communities that are at least uncertain about the impact of them and their children and their schools and their wider communities, there is nothing much they can do about it at the moment. So I would ask that the government looks very carefully, as my honourable friend says, that we look at the implications on individuals' health, on the, the wider ecosystem, but we also just take some time and recognise that precautionary principle is as important in this area as it is in general about air quality.